everyone. Welcome to the next conversation in the Hustle Fuel series. Our guest today is Dr. Shongamitra Bondopadhyay. She is a professor of machine intelligence at the Indian Statistical Institute and is also the director of the institute, the first woman to have held this position. She has also been a member of the Science, Technology and Innovation Advisory Council for the Prime Minister of India, one of the highest honors that a scientist in the country can hold. The emphasis prize in the engineering and computer sciences for her work in algorithmic optimization in biological data analysis and the Shanti Swarup Bhatnagar Prize also in the engineering sciences are just some of the multiple accolades that she has received along her illustrious career. Often lauded as an inspiring example of original computer science research done in India that has worldwide impact, Dr. Bondopadhyay's discoveries include a genetic marker for breast cancer, determination of the co-occurrence of HIV and cancers, and the role of white matter in Alzheimer's disease. Despite these numerous achievements, she says what makes her happiest is that her son is so proud of these achievements. I'm very honored to chat with her today about what she thinks are the big and complex problems that machine learning can help solve, why silos exist in science, and what we can do to help diffuse them, and how to pave the path for more women in STEM. Without any further ado, I'm very excited to get chatting with her. Hello. Hello, Aparajita. It's very nice to have you here. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you for the wonderful introduction. Uh, it's a pleasure to be on your show. I have seen some of your shows earlier. And I consider it my privilege and honor that you've invited me to this show. Absolutely. It's, it's our pleasure. Um, so getting started, as I said, your some of your seminal work has been the discovery of a genetic marker for breast cancer. To a layperson, um, could you explain what process resulted in that discovery and what it means for society? You're right. So you, you see, uh, we have to first understand a little bit about the genome that is there, the genes. We all talk about genes, but what actually are they? You see, in the cells, and uh, there are millions and millions of cells that make up in uh, make up the human body in particular, and many, many. So uh, within the cells, uh, there is this nucleus, and within the nucleus, there is the the DNA. And it is uh, DNA. If you think of it a uh, little more carefully, you can you can visualize the DNA as a string. In fact, you can visualize visualize the DNA as a ball of wool. And then now, when you once you unwind that ball of wool, you have that wool which you can lay out like a long stretch. Uh, and this, let us call it a string. <coughs> this string is essentially made up of four characters, which um, we have all maybe at some point read. <coughs> four characters like A, T, C, and G. Now. Uh, these, uh, I mean, the chromosomes actually are made up of all these pieces of DNA. Uh, and human, uh, humans have 22, um, 22 uh, autosomes and uh, 22 pairs of autosomes and one pair of sex chromosomes, the X and Y, uh, XX, XY, whatever it is that determines the sex of the individual. Uh, now, if you take out the DNA from each of these chromosomes, lay them out straight one after the other, then what you get is the genome. And it is parts of this genome which are actually called genes. And these genes code, they, they are responsible for the formation of certain proteins. Now, this protein, appearance of these proteins, uh, it doesn't happen in, it's a complicated process. It's not easy. It's a complicated process. And uh, while this protein is created before that what happens is something called messenger rna is created from a gene messenger rna a gene is responsible for the formation of messenger rna and then messenger rna through a, pr a process which is called translation uh, it results in the formation of a protein molecule okay so uh, now now if you take this genome as i said genome is a long stretch of DNA, long stretch of A, T, C's, and G's. Now, if you take this genome from any cell of the body, 
the genome will be exactly the same, meaning that stretch of ATCGs, A, T, T, C, A, G, A, whatever it is, that stretch, uh, that long um, string will be exactly the same. Yet you see that cells behave differently, right? Because they function differently. Some cells are responsible for formation of my fingers. Uh, I mean, they, they uh, go and form the fingers and then some cells are uh, there in which behave differently are there which is making up my heart another the lungs another set uh, so the different tissues of the body they are made up of cells which behave differently from each other so if the basic structure meaning that dna stretch the long string of dna if it's the same then why do these cells behave differently uh, is because the genes although the set of genes is the same in all these cells but genes are turned on or turned off. It's just like the rooms that we have where we may have the same set of lightings, but every room has its separate switching mechanism. And therefore, certain lights will be on, certain lights will be off. In another room, although we may have the exact same arrangement of lighting, but lights may be, certain bulbs or certain uh, lights may be turned on and so certain other lights will be turned off. And we can... So we can turn it on at some point of time and then turn it um, off again at another point of time for the same room. So this entire thing happens inside the cell. The genes are there, but certain genes turn on only at certain times because of certain conditions. Some turn off at certain conditions. Some remain silent. So it's based on which genes are active, to what level they are active, that these genes manifest their behavior in the sense that they produce their proteins and proteins essentially are the backbone of whatever is happening inside the cells, the chemical reactions and everything. So proteins are involved in almost all activities inside the cells. Now, the point is, if you are developing a certain cancer, uh, it is also because uh, often, very often, uh, cancer uh, being primarily of a genetic nature, the disease is primarily genetic, it means that certain genes are getting turned off or have undergone certain changes because of which whatever they are producing inside the cell, that is actually creating havoc in the sense in, in terms of cancer, it would be that they are responsible for, uh, for an explosion in the number of cells. The cells continue to divide but at the same time, there's an important process by which cells are also killed. And that is very normal. And unless this balance is maintained, uh, uh, so for life, this balance, it's critical that this balance is maintained. But because certain genes uh, have gone wrong, certain mutations may have appeared in the genes because of genetic reasons. So therefore, uh, I mean, things have gone wrong. This balance is affected. And it may so, so happen that G, uh, the, the cells are dividing, but cells are not getting killed at the appropriate rate. And therefore, that's an explosion of cells there. And that essentially is cancer. So uh, it's possible that cert you can identify that certain genes are responsible for certain types of cancer. Not every gene is responsible for everything because genes have their functions. Certain genes do simple housekeeping sort of activities. So the proteins that they produce simply take care of different uh, regular day-to-day -day activities of the cells, just like we have in offices and homes, etc. Certain genes do some very specific functions, and th if things go wrong, then those genes would be responsible for the disease. So similarly, for different types of cancer, it is important to be able to identify which are the genes which uh, are responsible for the disease for that particular type of cancer. For example, there are very well-known markers, marker genes for breast cancer, meaning that there are certain mutations which, if observed in certain genes, then that could, be a, that could lead to a possibility of breast cancer. So these are much of the uh, very good information is known about uh, breast cancer. But still, a lot needs to be also discovered. It's not that everything is known and we understand everything that's going on inside the cells. We only understand the tip of the iceberg. The cell is a lot more than what we have yet been able to understand. So, But every day with every research paper, with every research effort, 
a little bit more, a little bit more. That's what we are understanding. So uh, what my work in that particular work, what we did was we actually drew up a network, network of who is controlling whom which gene is controlling which molecule, which that molecule in turn is controlling some other molecule. So we were looking at it like a network of you know, controllers. This is controlling that, that is controlling this. Several things are controlling one particular um, molecule. That molecule may be controlling multiple molecules, not necessarily a single one. So we built that complex network and then we analyzed it in order to figure out. And this was done for, let's say, breast cancer data. Okay, so this network was drawn up for breast, breast cancer data. We also did it for colon cancer data. And once we were able to draw that network, then we analyzed it and tried to figure out which parts of this network, meaning which subset of molecules and their interactions are, are seen to be having a lot of uh, influence in the entire network. So uh, it's uh, you try to figure out which switches for example are always on in maximum number of rooms so that would mean that that particular lighting in that particular position has some importance so now since we were only analyzing breast cancer data and if something stood out by its importance then probably it has some implication in that disease that is generally the the uh, the conclusion and using our novel methods we were able to identify some molecules, a few molecules, four or five particular molecules, which are called microRNAs. And uh, so these are not normal uh, RNA molecules. These are very small RNA molecules. Now, once we were able to identify those microRNAs, then we looked into the literature about uh, information which is already existing for those microRNAs. And of the five, I, I think we had identified five. Of the five, about for three, for three or four, we got information, enough information from the literature that they were already known to be playing some role in breast cancer. But for one, there was no information available. That means that's a possibly a novel information, a novel marker, which needs to be looked into in the biological labs, in the wet labs, to validate that this indeed has an important role because there are often, you know, false signals which come out through computational methods. Although we try to bring in so much of uh, rigor in the process so that those false signals are minimized to a large extent, but nevertheless, it's, it's, it's not possible to eliminate it altogether. So that a computational approach indicates that this molecule is important for this disease does not mean 100% it will be important. It has to be validated. It has to be verified in the lab, <clears throat> in the wet lab through experiments. But our expertise ended with the computational work, statistical work, and we published it. And in fact, some other group, uh, later on we found, some other group had actually done an experiment independently. And it turned out that the molecule that we were indicating, that was also validated. But later on, independently they did it. It was not because of our paper that they did it. Uh, but they had actually looked into it and found that same marker. So this actually, these sort of results often give us a lot of happiness also, okay? That means the method that we have is not bad. It, we cannot claim it's good, but possibly it's not a bad method because biology is a very difficult uh, area to work in in any way. Uh, anyway. So whatever computationally we predict, we always say that this has this amount of confidence associated with it. It cannot be like a hard and fast prediction that it has to be true. So the more confident we are with the method, the more confident we would be when we apply it to newer data sets. So that, in fact, even others, biological uh, biologists, they would also like to, you know, test the results of those methods on which they have confidence. Because thousands and thousands of methods exist. And if the biologist keeps on, uh, you know, verifying or validating every such result which comes out, then they would also be wasting a lot of their time, resource, money, everything. So they also want good methods which uh, provide confidence, a lot of confidence to their predictions. And in that case, they are often agreeable to take it up in the laboratory and validate it. So my work dealt with that, but primarily I must say I was never into biology. Um, in my initial school days, in fact, um, biology was not my forte at any time. Uh, but uh, I studied computer science, 
and computer science of course i liked a lot because it's very logical and um, uh, it was only later that uh, i actually some student of mine got me interested in application of the methods that we were developing methods of machine learning artificial intelligence or pattern recognition because at that time we were calling it more as pattern recognition algorithms so and that those pattern recognition when uh, i mean it just changed shape a little and that's what essentially is the is the core of any machine learning technique right so uh, i would say my work was primarily in pattern recognition and then uh, some students of biology they got me interested that there are huge uh, it's a treasure of uh, problems that we have in biology where those methods can be applied and that's how i slowly moved into biology with my methods and then i also started understanding a little bit of biology and that's how uh, i am here today but i continue to do uh, uh, applications in biology as well as in other areas typically like in social networks etc so that is where i think uh, my work has primarily been uh, and i must say that although i work in computational biology at least a part of my significant part of my work is in the area of computational biology i remain a computer scientist at heart because my pleasure is in developing better and better algorithms and uh, also i can never claim that uh, i mean a, a person who has studied for example molecular biology would know a lot lot more than i do and therefore it is important and i often talk to those people who are experts in their domains to uh, understand but my reading of biology whatever i have learned by reading on my own as well as uh, whatever i learned in class those help me to understand the language of the biologist a little better had i because uh, you know people from different areas of expertise they speak very different languages and it's it's a barrier it's a, it's also a challenge to be able to understand each other right so that is where i think a biologist needs to learn a little computer science a little mathematics and a mathematician a computer scientist a physicist a statistician needs to learn a little biology but that doesn't make one a biologist yeah huh. so that should be very clear and that is where i think a mutual respect is of uh, utmost importance because if i think i know computer science i know biology i don't need anybody else that's not how things work and that's not how they are expected to work also then in that case the work will only go to a certain level and will stop there but my learning of biology does not make me a biologist but makes me eligible to speak to a biologist and understand what that person is trying to convey or maybe i can also convey my views or my suggestions or my discussion in a way that the biologist might understand so this is how i think uh, i have been working for so long and that's how things have worked out to some, to a large extent till date but i must also say that uh, uh, often collaborating across disciplines uh, it may sound very nice uh, but it takes a lot of effort and lot of you know just clinging on to it not letting it go to actually have that level of comfort where you can very easily collaborate that takes effort it's not easy and in particular i have seen in india uh, it has it is catching up it is catching up so there is hope uh, i don't think i mean it's very dismal situation i think situation is much better people are actually collaborating i, I see my students at least collaborating quite extensively and i'm very happy with that uh, <clears throat> and i have also try as much as i can but i have seen my students at least outdo me in those areas and i'm very happy for that they collaborate with biologists they collaborate with doctors and they have papers where all of them put in a lot of intellectual inputs and uh, my students are uh, publishing in fantastic uh, fantastic venues also which i mean these everything makes me very hopeful for the future of india future of indian science and future of science in general there is nothing called indian science and uh, western science or anything science is science so um, but the uh, situation i mean i am sure india is also going to play a major role in the days to come and uh, things are looking bright yeah um so so you said that you know obviously a computer scientist is not a biologist and vice versa but that your students are really moving the needle in terms of that 
great interdisciplinary collaboration and expertise what do you think are the tactical steps they are taking for say biologists to be more computationally literate and vice versa for you know both sides to understand the exchange and those borders to be more porous right right so first thing is nobody is going to teach you from scratch because this is not a school when you collaborate at this level nobody i mean everybody will expect a certain level of expertise from the other okay so uh, nobody will uh, you know sit down and spend hours together like a class teacher and explain everything from scratch so that is the effort that one needs to put in for example i had to put in a lot of effort to understand what little of biology i understand and that effort was primarily i think i got my students as my teachers so i would pester them again and again once they will explain and then next day i would forget and get back to them please explain what this term was please explain what this does what is this process how does this happen so that was one way in which i learned at least the initial th- days initial not days in initial months initial years i would say and at the same time the internet with so many videos nowadays with so many very nice wonderful beautiful lectures available uh, at your fingertips uh, those things have helped similarly i would say a biologist has to learn for example little at least some amount of programming some amount of computing skills uh, should be there what a computer is how it works etc a little bit of for example a little bit of it, at least of data structures and some some uh, level of mathematics that is more i think quite challenging these uh, uh, learning at a, at an advanced age or a, at a later point of time but it is not impossible it is it is possible uh, the effort is a little more but that has to be done and once a certain level has been achieved then of course you have to listen to uh, each other talk to each other uh, go to different workshops go to different uh, you know lectures which are there uh, and then it uh, slowly slowly it becomes uh, it becomes a little easier so one has to just not give up that is important one uh, should continue that effort and the more one continues the easier it becomes so there is uh, it's not impossible i think it is doable Uh, to achieve a certain level of expertise and then start collaborating and once this collaboration actually this mu- building up that mutual trust is what is what takes time and once the trust has been built within a group then you see the biologists would not hesitate to give the computer scientist or the mathematician a problem and say that see i'm facing this help me or the computer scientist would have no problem in telling the biologist okay i have this f- fantastic algorithm at uh, tell me some problems which where i can use it uh, or you can use my algorithm and not only that once that algorithm gives a result then the biologist would also not hesitate to experiment to validate the results that is where i think that level of trust has to be built and that level of building that level of trust is what would take time and one should not give up uh, you know just saying that oh it is difficult to collaborate yes it is difficult to collaborate no doubt but one has to just keep at it yeah and i think what you said a level of reciprocity is also very important right like that exchange on both sides of it so that matters as well and reciprocity reciprocity in terms of uh, you know the the respect one cannot think that okay so the computer scientist has this algorithm anyway i'm just using that algorithm then what will happen is this is not going to work that is hap- what happening many of the times this happens mm. that you anyway have developed your algorithm so it's so great about it i have this data i just want to use your algorithm that's it so you are somewhere i mean uh, an unimportant part of that uh, unimportant player in the scheme of affairs uh, if that happens then the level of trust will not uh, grow uh, because uh, nobody should be treated like a service you know service provider if they are treated at an equal footing that you are important i am important every uh, contribution from every individual in, on that work on that project is important for the success of the project so that level of respect and regard for each other that is important because everybody has come up to a certain level through a lot of effort before it so that has to be regarded that yes you understand your computer science i understand my biology or vice versa whatever it is and therefore we respect each other for your for the level of expertise that each of us has attained and uh, 
and accordingly we if we treat each other with respect i think the collaborations work out but it should never be a one way traffic only the uh, biology is saying that oh you have this is the algorithm you uh, or, or i have this problem you just try it out uh, so it has to be both way traffic sometimes the computer science uh, arrives at the door of the biologist or the biologist arrives at the door of the computer scientist for pro- pro- i mean for solving a problem etc so uh, then things work out pretty well and i've seen that is happening that is happening quite a bit got it you said another interesting thing you said even cutting edge computer science research needs to be validated and then incorporated into biological or medical research do you now in india see um, an increasing emphasis from large universities um, or even prestigious academic journals on open code and reproducible research oh yes in fact most of the research in computational biology even uh, i mean where there are methods uh, which uh, which is method intensive for example uh, or biology journals which are uh, data intensive the results are depending on uh, analysis of certain data sets this data has to be published i mean it has to be submitted even the methods have to be made i mean available because even the reviewers would like like to see like to uh, look at that method in particular even uh, run it execute it look whether the results are reproducible uh, that is happening in most of the big journals uh, so data and methods have to be shared it just cannot be that i keep my method to myself and just say that okay yes i've got this result people will uh, especially in the good venues would like to judge whether those results are reproducible and what you're saying is correct or not only then things move forward and how quickly do you typically see it being incorporated into medical practice or research <laughs> the findings that you have say in your your computer science papers it takes time it takes time it's not very quick it will take time got it um few, so like you few, said years. go ahead a few years got it so like you said um your focus is designing these innovative computer algorithms that then researchers use to identify patterns in really large data sets so in india and even more broadly globally what do you see as the the biggest applications of this pattern recognition and machine learning more broadly uh, i think in the days to come in the time to come uh this machine learning uh, my machine learning artificial intelligence is here to stay okay so uh, in many of these areas uh, interest goes up then goes down but i don't see any time soon this is going to happen in the area of machine learning because of the you know amount of data which is getting generated uh, and the need for the need that we all feel for the machines to become more and more intelligent earlier machines were only used for data crunching okay or maybe you have tons and tons of data and you want to retrieve certain data ha huh? rather than doing it on paper and pencil or keeping you know all these big 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 registers uh, you just computerize everything so that retrieval becomes very fast that was up to a certain point of time that's not what is uh, what will be important or what is important even now now what is important is whether the machine is able to learn you see you, there's a difference between retrieving data which is which you have stored in the machine and learning ha huh? what is the difference the difference is retrieving data means you've stored it you just want to retrieve get back that data very fast okay that is fast and fast quicker and quicker retrieval what is learning learning is you have not even stored that this is something new that the computer is now facing whether the computer can argue can you know still act, give you give you some actions based on a situation which it has never seen earlier so you understand that is learning learning to react to new situations learning to react to known situations there's nothing nothing to learn there because it is just like you know you have seen that case this is how the reaction should be so it's like a rule based system that if this is the case then this is this should be the reaction if this, if x then y if x then y that's a rule based system that's there's no real learning over there but if i have learned if x then y if x1 then y1 if x2 then y2 from there i have to learn that if x3 then what and i have never seen x3 before so that is what the machine is supposed to do and that is what these days 
that is the need for machines to be able to learn to able to generalize to new situations so that is where learning is coming in and that is what is going to be going to remain very important in the days to come in the years in the time to come so and its applications in first of course in healthcare that has immense applications over there immense applications are happening immense applications need to be looked into and immense discoveries uh, remain to be made uh, in the domain of healthcare uh, that is one thing another is uh, for example uh, climate climate change uh, climate environment these are the areas where also uh, a lot of applications of ai would need to come come in uh, huge applications of course in e-commerce and uh, this sort of areas in marketing in in business huge applications are there where you want to actually uh, for example strategize for even strategy uh, strategizing business decisions that means it's from nowhere you have to you have to look at multiple multiple situations and then try to you know make a strategy of what you what would be the best business decision huh? and that requires a lot of intelligence a lot of uh, planning where you see human beings i mean that's why human beings are so uh, that's where human beings are so experts in they can plan they can strategize that is where also artificial intelligence machine learning will play a role where computers will help the human beings in also these making these decisions and the government level huge amounts of data there also uh, in in helping in policy development policy making based on how certain policies are acting out are, are, are you know how they are behaving how what is the effect of that policy and while that policy is in action whether corrective steps whether uh, interventions can be brought in so that the effectiveness of certain policies can improve these uh, these are where uh, a lot of such uh, algorithms or a development of such algorithms would be necessary and they can play a really important roles but uh, it's on it's not we are not yet there so these applications are, is not that it's happening all the time it's not yet happening but these are the plans these are where a lot of artificial intelligence machine learning uh, developments have to take place in addition with uh, with a lot of huge huge amounts of data even the paradigm is going to change in the near future and as we have uh, we are all uh, aware quantum computing quantum information quantum uh, it's essentially quantum computing is going to make uh, a big entry there all countries are are uh, investing heavily in that domain so it's also important to develop you know develop methods which will work on such systems till now whatever methods we are we have in hand work for the conventional uh, computers which work, work on only bits zeros and ones so all the computers they work on binary uh, strings right binary um, so they work on bits meaning only zeros and ones that's the language the computer understands but very soon computers would need to understand uh, instructions in languages or, or they would be able to operate uh, in more number of states than just zero and one that's where quantum computing will come will make a big a big uh, impact and things then will become much much faster and uh, algorithms would also have to be geared towards towards that time those times are coming not very far away got it and so it's all about increasing like you said moving from that reactive end of the spectrum to increasing the predictive power of these algorithms do you think that is a function of just how much data you train your algorithms on or what are the other variables that will make them more predictive see uh, often we think that if we train it with tons and tons of data everything will be fantastic that need not necessarily be true i mean what is important is to be able to identify that critical part of the data which you need for your training it need not be tons of data okay because many data points are so similar to each other it is simply a waste of time you know uh, using all those data for your algorithm because they are all very very similar to each other 
So no point. So it's important to be able to sample the data in such an intelligent fashion so that you can really bring out that core of the data, which will, which will actually be a very good representation of the entire data. Uh, and with that, because often, uh, often uh, training with huge amount of data will not even be beneficial, even if the data is not noisy. I'm, I, I, it will certainly be harmful if a lot of data is noisy, meaning wrong data is there. Okay, then it will be harmful for the trade. But even if I assume that the data is not noisy, data is all very nice, good, high quality data, but too much of it. Even then, it will not be very good for the training, uh, for the learning task. You have to be able to pinpoint important data set. Maybe you don't have to really, you know, bring it down to only a very small set of data, but it could be reasonably large. But doesn't mean that you have to, you know, terabytes of data and every data point you have to fit into your uh, learning system. That uh, probably is not going to work. Uh, so... Uh, what is important is to get, you know, the true representative, the two true core of the data points. And the, it's not just how many data points you have, but also how many features you mean. I, I mean, if you look at it as a two dimensional matrix, you have the number of rows and the number of columns, uh, even the number of columns, which is called the dimensionality of the data, it can be very large. And most of it can be meaningless, actually. There are just, you know, different different observations about a single entity, for example, about a single person, uh, I can measure thousands of information, most of it, which is just, you know, meaningless, you don't even have to have that information for the learning task. So <clears throat> to be able to cut down on the rows, and to be able to cut down on the, on the columns also, that's, uh, that's all, that's very important, that is going to be very important, that is very important already. So these are called like sampling as well as feature selection, uh, feature extraction, and this sort of thing. And now, you see, um, now with this deep learning coming in, you might have heard of this term deep learning. Earlier, what happened is for any learning task, you had to look at entities and you had to determine that to the computer, what are the characteristics of the, this entity that I will use? That means uh, for each entity, for each object, maybe I decide that I will measure ten different uh, ten different values for this particular object. Okay, maybe it's length, it's width, it's height, or whatever it is. And those will be my numbers. And those numbers I will give to the computer for learning purposes. Okay, so this was called extracting the features, extracting the characteristics, the features of that object. How do I represent an object? That object could be a human being. That object could be a molecule, that object could be a mobile phone, I don't know. Okay, so how do I represent it to the computer? I need numbers, so that is how I do it. Now, here, as a human being, I may think, okay, these 10 features, but I might be missing some important characteristics, right? Because I'm a human being, I have certain limitations. I cannot understand or think of everything that could be important there. But with deep learning now, what is happening is you don't even have to extract the features. You can just for example, give the image, not the features, but the entire image. And then uh, you can give millions, uh, many, many images. And then the system will actually understand that what are the characteristics of this image, which is important for a cert for certain, you know, predictions, certain classes. It will learn it automatically. That is what, where the deep learning has really brought in a paradigm shift that it is possible for the computer, for the, for the algorithm to uh, also imagine by itself what features are really important for this particular learning problem. So that is why deep learning is now, I mean, is so popular these days. Yep. Yeah, as you said, separating that signal from the noise is also as important as just the, the size of Very your important. data set. Very important. Got it. Um, so switching gears a bit to your personal journey, as you said, your training was in, in physics and computer science, but then you got interested in biology. Um, as someone, you know, who had such a prestigious and old academic institute in India, what do you see as steps we can collectively take to pave the path for more women in STEM like yourself? 
Oh, women in STEM. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, uh, see, the path does not start at the higher education level. The path starts at primary education, right? If the ecosystem is not corrected at the primary level, nothing will work later on. If the root is weak, the fruit will be weak, okay? Maybe we will not even get the fruit. Forget about a weak fruit. Maybe the fruit will not come because the plant's roots are not deep enough, are not strong enough. And that has to start without any question from the primary level. So primary education, a lot of focus has to be there in primary education and in making primary education much more gender balanced. Uh, so that not only gender, by gender balance, I mean the boys uh, keep on, I mean, they very much, they are very much in schools, but the girls have to be brought into schools and care has to be taken in the social ecosystem that girls do not drop out early because there's a huge amount of talent in the girls who drop out very early in the game okay so let alone at the university level or the college level they can't, don't even many many of these girls don't even cross the school level so forget about stem okay so that is where it starts primary education and the way primary education, uh, I mean, I, I mean, we need a, a relook, a very serious relook, independent of boys and girls, at the primary education itself, so that it keeps the student. Now, I'm not talking of girls or boys. I'm talking of ge generally the students interested in, first of all, education, and also interested in science uh, and technology and mathematics. So that is where the primary education First of all, the primary education kills the innovation, the, the, the interest of the student in academics, then what? I mean, you will lose many early on. That we cannot hope, uh, I mean, uh, that we cannot, uh, we cannot let it happen. So that is once the first and the foremost step. Then, of course, the social ecosystem, so that this, at the school level, the girls do not drop out, and also the school education, which should let the girl remain in the system and not only remain in the system but get more and more interested in science technology mathematics and the social system also i mean we keep on saying these days and i'm sure i'm seeing changes happening but not at the rate that we would like it to many girls uh, underage marriage and things like that or even not underage proper time but too early marriage huh? because um, then uh, then childbirth comes in and a lot of things which come in which automatically snatch the woman away from uh, any sort of academic or uh, any other activity except uh, within the house so once the, if that is the, also that also needs to be taken care of uh, in a large measure and then of course the women also have to understand that it's not only the external world which will you know pave the way for them to come in and you know, succeed that's a, there's a fight to be fought there, okay? There's a battle to be won. The battle first has to be fought and won there. So uh, taking it easy will never do. Uh, one has to accept from the woman's point of view also that at least in the initial days of the battle, the work will be twice as hard. You see, that happens all the time. For any change to happen, there have to be champions from within that system. Okay, so the women themselves have to lead the challenge and those who lead the challenge will have to put in double the effort. And uh, one cannot, you know, cringe away from that and say, no, 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 I cannot put in that amount of effort. That has to be brought in for that acceptance in the society to come later on. For the, I mean, once a generation has put in that fight, next generations will find it easier to walk that path. And acceptance from the society in general will also be higher. Nowadays, we see in many places that acceptance that the woman will work is much higher. But that is also, um, I mean, what we get to see is at a very high level in the society already. Those who have come in into, let's say, uh, a university, it's already at a higher level. But many, many, many uh, women, <clears throat> they don't get this opportunity, right? Not only no, uh, opportunity, but even the opportunity to go out of their homes and work. Uh, many are tied down into, the, into their households. So what I see that changes are happening, changes that I see 
are only a very small fraction of the entire population. So a lot of uh, the other uh, huge percentage is, I mean, that battle, a lot of the battle is still to be, still to be fought and still, and way to go before we actually win it, where there'll be true, in true sense, the equality, equality of opportunity. You cannot, you know, equality of, you cannot just give something, some job to somebody. But what you can do is to make that person capable to compete for that job. Give that opportunity to compete for that job. That is where I want the equality of opportunity. Huh? So equality of opportunity to achieve it in the truest sense is still miles away. But we are moving towards that. And that is what what's actually, uh, that's the hope that we have. That maybe even if not in my lifetime, maybe my next generation will see it. Because we see some things happening in the positive direction. In all strata of the society for that matter. Not just in the higher, but in all strata. Uh, and if we care to look for it, there are role models in every strata of the society. There are fantastic stories to be heard, even in the lowest strata where women have uh, overcome all odds and have come out with flying colors. Not everybody has to go to space to show that women... Uh, are doing well or not not everybody has to become a professor of a university or the director of an institute to show that women are doing well at every strata women there are role mod women role models so one just has to care to look around and there are enough role models these days you are for example a role model uh, in your own way that i mean how to take things forward how to bring other women uh, in front of, I mean, how to bring a, a woman who has done certain uh, certain things in front of other students. So that itself is a very important job, which if many of us try to emulate what you are doing, I think that is also a very important contribution to the society. Thank you. That's, that's very kind. You said something very interesting. You said regardless of gender, uh, we need to focus at a very early level to foster an innovation mindset. What do you think schools, teachers, parents can do to foster that innovation mindset at an early age? Right. One is at the very early age, when the children are really children. Okay. Let's say, uh, if we have to give numbers, let's say till class four or five. Till class four or five, there should be, you know, fun learning. By, uh, let's say, now let's break it down a little bit. Uh, more in detail let's say up to class two up to class two and necessary to it's not necessary to teach at all huh? yeah. maybe just a little bit of okay a little bit of writing but till class one or two it should be just learning from nature learning to observe nature learning to uh, you know uh, just what this flower is called uh, how from the seed, the uh, plant is uh, is coming out, not in books, but observation. Observing the stars, observing, I mean, there are thousands and thousands of things uh, which, uh, so when uh, many, many, many years ago, how scientists observed nature and came up with solutions. Get that observation into the student. Don't have to teach anything from the books. Uh, I mean, nothing major. But if you look at even class one or class two students, they have to learn you know, so many things. Huh? Where is this country? What is the capital of that country? Not necessary at all. In fact, visit, if, if you can, visit the places, visit the city, show the history of the city, tell stories, all through storytelling and activities and observing nature. That is how... Uh, you know, up to that very young age, <clears throat> I know where, uh, of course, in more developed economies, where very young children were taught to extract the, um, you know, extract uh, nuclear, uh, the materials from the, 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 what should I say, cellular RNA, for example, how to extract. So, um, you know, they don't have to know what is that. But that it can be done. Okay, this is how you do it. You you keep a note of, okay, so um, uh, how many leaves are, uh, keep a note of, okay, well, like 
what is the length uh, how how are the plants growing by the day for example keep a note of that so in that same way you not only learn counting you also learn how to you know tabulate results keep a note and then try to see okay uh, was the rate of growth equal over the days or did it change so then you've already learned about this rate of growth that there is something called the rate of growth not by you know learning okay x1 minus x2 by time and remembering that equation but by actual observation so it needs a, a, a great amount of thought process of coming up with enough materials of this type so that while the children is learning the children just feels you know it's learning by walking through it it's not learning not walking through the computer based uh, virtual reality i'm not even saying that yeah. and that's one way better than learning from books but through virtual reality but if you can really learn while sitting within nature while doing activities within nature you you can see you can learn numbers you can run, learn words you can learn alphabets many things can be learned by activities so that is how and then if uh, once that interest you caught them young once you've caught them young now these minds are ready to take much more okay now because pressure will come it is not that entire academic career will go without the pressure of academics that is not going to happen but if the pressure comes too early then people get turned away from this academics so if you have if you have managed to hold on to these bright young minds many more will now be ready to take that pressure pressure will come you go into class 8 9 10 11 12 then more into university there will be huge amount of pressure in fact at the higher education in india i don't see that amount of pressure there has to be more pressure there okay and but the mind should be made so that they will be able to accept that pressure but what is happening now because they have been pressurized so much at a young age they don't want to take pressure these minds don't they shy away from pressure at the stage when it really matters for the country because that is where the research will come in now unless that student is able to take that pressure at the real age where it matters because then the discoveries will start the inventions will come and then it has to be pressure i mean day in and day out one has to work there is nothing called you know do getting it easy nothing will come easy that pressure everybody has to be prepared for that but the ground has to be solid so that the pressure you know that the pressure the ground should be able to bear that pressure so that is what what i mean yeah absolutely and i feel like a child's mind is so malleable as well right it's like a sponge like whatever you give it it will absorb like even in language learning like up until the age of 5 a child can just pick up as many languages as you expose them to natively and that's true of scientific education as well like you just expose them and they just absorb it all so like you said that solid foundation is just very important to withstand what right. what comes next i mean uh, yes from the young age many many activity based learning but again we as soon as we say activity based learning again we put it into you know some molds and then there'll be thousands of companies which will help you do these activities i mean that's that's a disaster that's a disaster you understand what i'm trying to say yeah. the mind yeah. has to be it cannot be like a horse which just sees this much yeah. it has to be yeah. open so the child will actually put a sugar there and will wait to see when an ant finds that sugar and then what happens where does that ant go and then one ant finds the sugar and then goes back and then two four five i mean many many ants start coming in how many ants are coming in at mm-hmm. what intervals what time keep a note learn to observe but don't compartmentalize all these learning into again very specific activities so that again you have tuitions for observing the ants so <laughs> that would be a disaster yeah, yeah. <laughs> i hope i was able to communicate what i yeah. want yeah yeah absolutely that was wonderfully said um and my final question which i ask all my guests to wrap up if you could look back on your journey and go back in time and give some advice to your 18 year old self what advice would that be do the mathematics a little better <laughs> that would my uh, advice to me uh, if i had understood uh, how important mathematics is for anything that you do 
so i would have told myself to do the mathematics at that level much better than what i did i did okay but i would have really uh, i would have told myself then that do it better than what you are doing it <laughs> that's great advice i think all all children who are at that age they'll probably take the the math more seriously after hearing that from you um well but, but, uh, but also other than mathematics i would say develop a hobby i i had my hobbies so i would not say that i did not have it i would not tell myself at 18 years have a hobby because i had my hobbies uh, mm -hmm. and i was really serious about my hobbies i mean I, it gave me a lot of pleasure uh, for example my music and all these things and reading reading story books of various types uh, watching movies uh, those were all my hobby i mean i like those things and i had enough of those pleasure type of activities entertainment type of activities uh, so develop hobbies yes i not to my my 18 year old i mean myself but to others uh, also maybe languages again not to myself because i was always interested in languages uh, and um, but I, i to myself i would have said do your mathematics a little better than what you do but to other students i would say i have a hobby do your mathematics well and do your languages also very well yeah that's that's wonderful uh dr bondopadhyay it's truly been an honor thank you so much this has been a wonderful conversation and i'm sure our viewers will find it as engaging and enriching as i did thank you so much aparajita and my pleasure I, i again thank you for having me on your show as your guest thank you very much thank you okay.